In a little less than a year, the financial crisis reached a new level and spread to the whole country. In the countryside, the situation was alarming, worse than that of the cities. Wheat went down 50% in value. The spectacular fall in farm prices hit farmers hard, and their produce became unsellable. There were millions of tons of food, but no one could afford to buy. Farmers could no longer pay their debts, were thrown off their land, and took to the roads. The plight everybody identifies with, the plight of homelessness, of poverty, of no work, of family disintegration, becomes a universal plight. People were looking for new places to work, and so there was, there was this sense of moving around and uh, also moving out of the agricultural states, which were particularly badly affected. There are mass migrations out of the Middle West uh, uh, of evicted farmers looking desperately for work someplace, migra migrant labor of some kind or another. And many of them lost their farms at this time, and this was in the uh, early 1930s. And farm evictions were a terrible stain upon, upon society. Many farmers were evicted because they, they rented their land or they owned their land and they couldn't keep up the payments. Farmers out in the Midwest are, are forcibly stopping auctions from happening for, for, by evicted farmers. When the judge shows up to auction off the farm, the farmer's neighbors gather and pay a penny for that farm. Don't let anybody else bid and return the farm to the evicted farmer. We're going to get some tar tin. Who get tin for it? Six cents. Six cents bid. Who get tin? I'm a six to buy a tin. Six cents for it. Who get tin for it? Take Five it out. Ten. We can't use that stuff. We've got to go back to the museum. I'm going to dime for Fifteen. Uh, Fifteen I got. Four. 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 Yeah. So there. Yeah. Outside yeah. with her. Yeah. In rural areas, you have no place to go. And what you have here, what the real tragedy is, that's kind of stupid irony, that you have farmers destroying their crops because they literally can't afford to take them to market for the prices they're getting, and people are going without food. You have people... Um, cold and without clothing when the warehouses are bulging with clothing. You have homes and apartments standing empty while people are having to sleep in the streets and on the subway and in the subways and so forth. It's that irony that, that really was grating about the Depression. And here was an economic system that blew up between 1929 and 1932. And when you've got a, an explosion of this kind, it's very difficult to just stick the bits together again and carry on as if nothing happened. The steel industry is operating by 1931 at 10% of its capacity. Unemployment will soon approach 25% of the workforce. There was a kind of uh, agitation in the country. It was turmoil. There were strikes going on and there were picket lines and, and demonstrations. The Communist Party was leading a struggle for the rights of workers. There was something about the poverty, the t conditions of that time, which made many people feel that, oh, yes, this is the only organization that is doing something about the Depression. All the social insurgencies of the 1930s, whether they are anti-monopoly movements or farmer labor independent political parties, have a heavy quotient of progressive and radical militants. The labor movement in the 1930s is inconceivable without the role, vital role, played by militant cadre from the Communist Party and the Socialist Party. Alors à partir de là, un cycle s'enclenche, c'est un cycle de répression. Et en fait, la violence va apparaître, il va y avoir des manifestations, il va y avoir des morts, euh, il va y avoir tout ça. Mais il n'y a pas du tout de vraie révolte. Et il va donner lieu à des images chocs, à des révoltes sporadiques. À Durborn, là où Ford a licencié les trois quarts de ses salariés, il y a eu des émeutes où là aussi... Euh, la police tire sur les manifestants. In Ford factories, where the number of workers had dropped from 130,000 to 37,000, those who were lucky enough to keep their jobs saw their monthly salary fall from 50 to 16 dollars. And when they went on strike, the police opened fire on them. Five were killed and dozens wounded. <laughs> 
Herbert Hoover does certain things which are f so offensive, and perhaps the most offensive thing he does is to send troops to break up what is called the Bonus Army, which is gathered in Washington, uh, and these are veterans of World War I, to demand uh, an early payment of the bonuses that were promised them when they returned from the European War in 1918. 12, 14,000 came from all over the country. They rode the rails, mounted trains they couldn't afford. Every way they could, they came to Washington, D.C. They presented a petition to uh, Congress, and Congress rejected it. They sort of set up camp on the Mall, which became the sort of Hooverville of the, the Bonus Expeditionary Force. Some of the um, people who had come went home. Some really didn't have any reason to go home, so they just stayed on. Uh, and they were no threat to anybody. Hoover allowed himself to be led astray by two soldiers, Major Dwight D. Eisenhower, future U.S. President, and above all, General Douglas MacArthur. Douglas MacArthur, you have to understand, was the kind of person who, once he got an idea in his head, it never occurred to him that it could be wrong. Uh, and he got the idea in his head that these people represented a grave threat to the republic, that they might somehow storm Congress or do something. I mean, these were families. It's not that they're not just an army. They're not armed or anything. And he began to put this to Hoover. And finally, MacArthur persuaded him that this was indeed a threat. And Hoover sent out the military to shoot at them. It was disastrous. Under General MacArthur's command, four cavalry platoons, an infantry column, equipped with bayonets and gas masks, and six tanks attacked and set fire to shacks. Two people were shot dead and a third, a two-month-old baby, suffocated to death from tear gas. Another child was more fortunate. As he tried to return to his shack to get his teddy bear, a soldier stopped him by stabbing him in the legs with his bayonet. It was an ugly thing. And what it did, and the, the reaction of the American people was, Herbert Hoover must have lost his mind. This destroyed the last shred of credibility he had. MacArthur, because he was MacArthur, went to his grave believing he'd save the Republic from, you know, a revolution. A great irony that the heroes of, military heroes of World War II, MacArthur, Eisenhower, would attack the veterans of World War I and break up the bonus army. And this so angers people. Uh, it's such a brutal uh, kind of callous indifference to the plight of Americans. That incident basically killed Hoover's reputation. I mean, his reputation was already in disrepair over the bad economic policies. That was disastrous for Hoover's approval ratings. Prosperity is just around the corner. What we'd like to know is which corner. We've turned so many corners now, we're dizzy. But still, I'm positive we'll soon be busy. Hoover, again with great reluctance, uh, begins to establish some minimal forms of federal relief. But all of Hoover's actions don't measure up to the dimensions of the crisis. They don't come close to measuring up to the severity of the crisis. The governor of New York, remember, was Franklin D. Roosevelt. And Roosevelt did try to institute some sort of welfare programs to alleviate the suffering because it was so obvious in big cities like New York. Roosevelt himself, of course, was rich and aristocrat, and he was not really attuned to the lives of the poor. His wife, Eleanor Roosevelt, she actually went into poor districts, and she saw how people lived. She had seen with her own eyes the conditions of the poor, how much poverty there was and how much distress there was was made known to Roosevelt, not directly, but from his wife. Everybody expected Eleanor Roosevelt to show up because she was his eyes and ears, and she went all sorts of places. Roosevelt depended upon her because he couldn't get to a lot of places. Roosevelt, who was struck by polio in 1921, faced a problem with no historical precedent, 
He was disabled, and yet he stood at the next presidential election against Hoover. He had promised he would to millions of underprivileged who were awaiting upon him like the Messiah. There's a, a poem called Waiting on Roosevelt. <laughs> we're waiting for Roosevelt to do something for us. We're waiting and waiting. <laughs> and so the poem ends some, with something like, you know, where are you, Mr. <laughs> On July 2, 1932, the Democrat Party convention chose Franklin D. Roosevelt as candidate for the presidential election. He pronounced for the first time the words, New Deal. I pledge myself to a new deal for the American people. In this dramatic context, the elections in November 1932 had symbolic significance. Roosevelt promised to curb the devastating effects of the 1929 crash with measures such as the reform of the banking system, the assurance of a healthy currency, and economic and social aid. But what convinced the voters was, to his despair, his rather hasty promise to repeal the amendment which prohibited the consumption of alcohol, in other words, the end of the prohibition. Franklin D. Roosevelt won with 23 million votes, compared to Hoover, who only obtained 16 million. This landslide victory put the Democrats in power for the next 20 years. Franklin D. Roosevelt, President of the United States. Let me thank you again and tell you that I hope to see you all very soon and bid you an affectionate good night. In November 1932, the United States had just elected Roosevelt. Meanwhile, Germany was at crossroads in its destiny. The economic crisis threw many worried, desperate Germans into Hitler's arms. The capital repatriated to the U.S. brought him instant success. They're not going to put a painter in Bismarck's chair, Roosevelt commanded. J'ai encore souvenir très précis d'un certain nombre de champs extérieurs et des drapeaux à croix gammées vraiment partout. Tout d'un coup. On se retrouve devant les Hitlériens qui siègent d'ailleurs au Reichstag en uniforme, qui dans la rue commencent à battre les gens et la terreur commence à s'installer dès l'automne 1932. The anxiety, the fear, the scapegoating that naturally accompanies this kind of economic desperation had been abroad in the land in Germany for many years. Now becomes even more popular and then looking for scapegoats for the collapse. Communists, Jews. Mon père est donc directeur d'une clinique pédiatrique, professeur à l'université, franc-maçon, électeur, père de famille et juif. Et Hitler l'a réduit à l'état de juif. Il a été chassé de l'université et j'ai été battu en classe comme petit juif, en cela dans la cour de l'école. Ça n'a pas laissé de traces, mais c'était très sensible. Les Allemands se sont convaincus que seule la, la pureté de la race pouvait être une solution à leur, à leur problème. Dans l'idée d'Hitler, les, les juifs euh, étaient euh, le poison à abattre. Il faut un bouc émissaire, il faut tuer l'autre. On peut voir comment... Euh, une théorie du bouc émissaire, tout simplement, peut, peut se mettre en place. Ce sont les Juifs qui étaient responsables parce qu'ils incarnent le capitalisme mondial et que donc forcément, ils étaient aux côtés de l'Amérique. Hitler ne faisait moins de 2% des voix en 1929. Donc il faudrait une extraordinaire concomitance d'événements pour qu'il passe de 2% à 33% entre 1929 et 1933. On dit souvent que les chômeurs ont amené Hitler au pouvoir, c'est absolument pas vrai. Quand on regarde leur vote, et même celui des ouvriers, c'est plutôt les classes moyennes qui ruinaient, déboussolaient et qui, qui ont voté pour, pour Hitler. I think there's no question that the economic collapse, the global economic collapse of that period is responsible, heavily responsible for the, for the rise of Hitler. Uh, there are similar movements even in, in a place as politically placid as the United States, the, the growth of fascist movements It's against Jews and Wall Street, Semitic Wall Street financiers as the main producers of the Depression, as Shylocks who are looting the American economy. There's a tradition of that, a kind of underground tradition of that in American political life that surfaces in the 30s. Lots of anti-Semitism. I also leveled at the Roosevelt administration, which had many Jewish people working there. We do not have a perfectly uh, 
moral history. There are famous Americans who actually give voice to anti-Semitic sentiments. Henry Ford, who's an American icon, he's an American hero. He's Hitler's hero, too. Hitler actually has a photograph of Henry Ford in his, in his, in his headquarters in Berlin or someplace. And the reason for that is that Hit, uh, Ford, during the 1920s, had written a series of articles that became a book, a bestseller, called The International Jew. And it was about how Jewish financiers were conspiring to undermine the American heartland. They were also spreading a kind of promiscuous culture, a kind of decadent culture. They were the purveyors of, of movies, lascivious movies and sexy novels. And uh, they were behind bootleg liquor and scandals of all kinds. And, 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 and Ford talks about this kind of international Jewish conspiracy to undermine hardworking, uh, frugal, uh, productive America. And he's enormously popular. Who, Ford was, could have probably run for president and maybe won in the mid-1920s. There were movements everywhere. There were very sensible people who had pretty uh, ideas that were no longer sensible. The crisis accentuated the rise of populism and extremism. All over the place, there were upsurges in anti-Semitism, xenophobia, and racism. The Ku Klux Klan had four million members, mainly in the South. Their constitution said, our duty is to maintain forever the supremacy of the white race. They advocated hatred towards foreigners, Jews, and in particular blacks, whom they hunted down after dark to lynch them. But people forget what a dangerous time it was politically in America and around the world. Democracy was threatened in America by the severe economic uh, circumstances. The 30s are full of signs of, of uh, social upheaval on the right that might be characterized as fascist or Nazi-inspired. This procession of Nazi demonstrators did not take place in Germany, but in Central Park, New York. 20,000 people, including 8,000 uniformed stormtroopers, and thousands of American teenagers who came from youth camps, organized according to the model of the Hitler youth camps, headed towards Madison Square Garden to proclaim the rights of white Christians, true patriots. During the meeting, the crowd booed President Franklin D. Roosevelt and made the Nazi salute, crying out, Heil Hitler. to parade in the streets and they begin to beat up uh, people in the streets, suspect people, Jews, immigrants. For the first time in a very long time there was a serious possibility of some kind of dictatorial government, some kind of ideological uh, overthrow of democracy. I think it was probably a real possibility. <laughs> On February 15, 1933, two weeks after Hitler had risen to power, Roosevelt narrowly escaped an assassination attempt as he was making a speech in Miami. The mayor of Chicago was hit by two bullets instead and died, thanking the Lord for sparing Roosevelt. Roosevelt, who didn't attend the funeral, went back to Washington, where he multiplied by 20 the number of his bodyguards and stopped traveling in open-top cars. He knew that he had many enemies, that he was seen as a red by the business world, the Supreme Court, and Congress. 
In the car which drove the two presidents, Hoover barely said a word to Roosevelt. He knew that the new president wouldn't spare him in his inaugural speech, and he wouldn't be disappointed. Only a fool can deny the somber reality of the present. Those who governed us failed because they knew nothing but the laws of profit. 500,000 Americans wrote to him before he entered the White House to welcome and encourage him. Roosevelt took office. He made a superhuman effort to give the crowd the impression he was walking when, in fact, he was being carried by his son and a bodyguard. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. By the time he was inaugurated, the financial system was paralyzed. It was almost that way then. The banks were hardly doing anything, and something had to be done to restore confidence in the banks. The banks were in such disarray that he felt that he could revive the banking system by closing all the banks. He didn't come on and say dramatically, we're going to close the banks and we'll do something. He came on in a much lighter mood and said, everybody is over anxious about this. We're going to close the banks and all the banks that are sound will be allowed to reopen. I can assure you that it is safer for you to keep your money in a reopened bank than to keep it under the mattress. When the banks reopened, the financial crisis had passed. Uh, it was a brilliant piece of psychology. He fixed the price of toute une série d'éléments de manière totalement autoritaire. He choisissait la variation uh, du cours du dollar tous les matins au petit déjeuner uh, avec deux conseillers et qui disaient bon, écoutez, on laisse monter, on laisse filer, on laisse pas filer. And one morning, uh, he said to Henry Morgenthau, who would later become his Treasury Secretary, not yet, he said, "Let it go up 21 cents." And Morgenthau said, "Why, Mr. President?" And Roosevelt says, well, it's because it's three times seven, and three is a lucky number. And the arbitrary aspect of this displeased markets, of course, as Morgenthau wrote in his diaries, if anyone knew how we set the gold price, they would be frightened. What Roosevelt has that Hoover lacked is an open mind. He's experimental. He's willing to hear dissident voices, even voices he doesn't agree with, and also a recognition that the crisis is severe and you must try something, and if that something doesn't work, try something else. Don't sit there. Roosevelt crée les bases d'un monde nouveau. Mais en même temps, la dimension mythologique, c'est qu'il n'y avait pas de plan concerté, c'était un tâtonnement généralisé. People have nothing to sustain them through these difficult times and, no, and no wherewithal to purchase. Franklin Roosevelt recognized that this crisis of underconsumption is killing, potentially fatal. Pour lutter contre la crise, il faut qu'on euh, emb embauche des chômeurs à creuser des trous le, le matin, qu'ils reboucheront le soir. Peu importe l'utilité sociale de cette embauche, ce qui compte, c'est de restaurer la capacité à consommer des agents qui, sinon, peuvent tout simplement euh, dégringoler toute la pente de, de la crise. Roosevelt a très bien su se saisir d'une certaine mythologie des États-Unis, et c'est ça son mérite. Ceux qui sont valides, on leur donne une pelle, on leur demande de faire des routes. Et le talent de Roosevelt, ça a été de, euh, de trouver des slogans, mais aussi un choix politique. C'est l'homme de la rue, le common man, qui devient véritablement le, euh, le noyau de la coalition de Roosevelt. Et ce n'était pas du tout la coalition, la coalition de Hoover. Hoover était, lui, le, le représentant du monde des affaires. After the banks, Roosevelt decided to clean up Wall Street as he had promised to do so in his new deal. So there's absolutely no doubt that there was a real new deal. We had new regulations to stop the kinds of uh, financial shenanigans that had caused the crisis. To head the Securities and Exchange Commission, Roosevelt chose Joseph Kennedy, the father of the future president of the United States. Roosevelt had wanted to make him his secretary for the Treasury, but Congress had refused his nomination because Kennedy was about to be charged by a Senate commission of inquiry for stock market speculation, embezzlement, and above all, for his role in the collapse of Wall Street in 1929. He becomes a major funder of his campaign, and Roosevelt shocks the nation by appointing Joseph Kennedy, of all people, to be the first 
chairman of the SEC. Well, who better to watch the market? Joseph Kennedy actually made a large bit of his fortune, not just in speculating in the 20s. He was one of the few who got out of the market because he saw what was coming. When the market crashed, he went back in and he started buying handfuls of stock of all kinds of companies and putting them in the drawers and waiting for them to come up again because he knew eventually they'd be worth a lot. He has connections to the bootleg liquor industry in the 1920s. He's a larger-than-life figure who becomes enormously wealthy and enormously uh, despised by ordinary Americans as a not-to-be-trusted speculator who makes a fortune off of other people's misfortune. But Roosevelt knew Kennedy was one of the brightest, shrewdest, yeah, unscrupulous, but after all, he's dealing with bankers and lawyers. They were putting the fox in charge of the chicken coop. That was criticism. But the president had reasons for doing that, which is he said Mr. Kennedy knew all the tricks. He knew Wall Street. He knew the games. He knew the backstories. He knew all of that. He knew where the bodies were buried. Kennedy, as the first SEC chairman, was known himself for being somewhat of a swindler and a fraud. Uh, but to me, it's not inconsistent with what the SEC stands for. What the SEC stands for is an agency that permits and institutionalizes and exonerates fraud instead of fighting it. So the fact that Kennedy headed the SEC was actually quite a... Roosevelt's naivety and lack of tact were sometimes surprising. To a group of young workers who had volunteered to finally have something to eat, he declared... I wish that I could take a couple of months off from the White House and come down here and live with them, because I know I'd get full of health the way they have. The only difference is that they've put on an average of about 12 pounds apiece since they got here, and I'm trying to take off 12 pounds. <laughs> Roosevelt was good in reassuring people. He was good in convincing people that the government cared about them, the government could do something. Preceded by a big show, Roosevelt launched his program to fight the effects of the Great Depression and to give a new boost to the American economy which had been ravaged since the 1929 stock market crash. Five billion dollars were allocated to fight unemployment. Over three million Americans were hired, rising to eight million two years later. Roosevelt had 15 key laws passed. He established a system of social welfare, pensions, unemployment benefit. He outlawed child labor, discrimination against hiring blacks and women, and he introduced a minimum wage. What characterizes the New Deal in the mid-1930s is a whole array of uh, public works programs. Nobody had done this kind of thing before. Um, people did have an idea, I think, that big public works projects uh, would be a help, and that was an important part of the New Deal, and it was psychologically important. The New Deal changed America. We built countless roads, bridges, dams, schools, roads and bridges here in New York City where we're sitting today that were built with New Deal money. Uh, it changed America dramatically. That wouldn't have occurred. And it set the stage for the post-World War II economic expansion. Government spending had been used to build highways, construct schools, build hospitals, invest in research. We move into a welfare state, which we had not had before. But they are really trying to deal with both manufacturing, with construction, with welfare, with social situation, social welfare, I should say, simultaneously. There was no uh, social welfare system. The United States was the last industrial country in the Western world to introduce any kind of social safety nets, like unemployment insurance, old age pensions, and so forth. Il a fait des choses qui ont eu un avenir extraordinaire. Il a créé la sécurité sociale en 1935. Il a posé les bases de la sécurité sociale aux États-Unis. Social security did not apply to the poorest of workers, and these were the black workers. It did not apply to domestic workers, maids, dishwashers, porters. These were the jobs that were held by black people. They were the last in everything. They were the first to lose their jobs, if they had jobs. The black people 
simply uh, did not benefit from the New Deal measures in the way that white people did. African Americans were in the same position as other Americans, but worse, because they had been worse to begin with, and comes the Depression, the situation is extremely difficult. The old unions had no black people. They only had skilled workers, and the black people were not the skilled workers. They were not allowed into the unions. One of the reasons there is such a disparity in income and wealth in the 20s is because unions are so weak. Um, there's no defense against this uh, uh, corporate uh, effort to keep wages low. Striking is still illegal in the United States, so until that time, a labor union had absolutely no standing in law. All of that changes in the 1930s. A whole series of social uprisings in the 1930s move America's political uh, spectrum to the left and has an enormous impact on Roosevelt himself. Supported by public opinion, Roosevelt set up the right to union representation for all American workers. It was an absolute revolution. But its implementation met with the reticence of the business world and company heads. Strikes and factory sit-ins occurred in many firms to protest about the boss's refusal to recognize the unions. But the bosses finally gave in, as industry was at a standstill. The labor movement explodes. It organizes millions of American industrial workers who had never been organized before in the heartland of American industry. And that's what led to the wave of strikes. And it put Roosevelt in a very awkward position. Uh, and I don't think he regretted any of that, but it, it did make recovery that much more difficult. There was a general strike in San Francisco, the whole city tied up. Deputy was beaten to death and scores were in Minneapolis, a general strike. Hundreds of thousands of workers in the South who worked in textile mills went out on strike. So this was a time in the country of great turmoil and agitation, and Roosevelt was very conscious of that. government of the New Deal supported the bosses, even when the latter had broken the new laws. Steel factories in Chicago refused to recognize the unions. Faced with the quasi-insurrectionary nature of strikes, the police, with the help of the bosses' militia, killed 10 workers and injured nearly 100. Roosevelt, who didn't condemn the massacre, sent in the National Guard. The political leaders of the country uh, in both parties Republican and Democratic Party uh, were fearful when they saw the agitation in the country and when they saw one-third of the workforce was unemployed and when they saw all the strikes and the riots going on the rich corporations were opposed to Roosevelt they were worried about whether the capitalist system would be able to survive and the business community and the financial community begins to become very hostile. They denounce him in the most vile ways uh, as a cripple, as a Jew, as a, a communist, uh, as gay. There's no, there's no epithet. They, they won't direct at him. They're so angry at the way he has broken uh, with the class, after all, that he came from. He's considered a traitor uh, to, his, to his class. And Roosevelt says to them, bemused, I think, to some degree, why do you hate me so much? What I'm trying to do is save capitalism. A few timid people who fear progress will try to give you new and strange names for what we are doing. Sometimes they will call it fascism, and sometimes communism. 
and sometimes regimentation, and sometimes socialism. But in so doing, they are trying to make very complex and theoretical, something that is really very simple and very practical. Those were good things that Roosevelt did. Those New Deals were good. Other parts of the New Deal were absurd. The only sector which didn't improve was agriculture. To help the farmers survive, Roosevelt got them to reduce their production, to push up farming prices in exchange for compensation. But this policy was contested by several economists who considered that the government was carrying out an unjustifiable destruction of wealth which was contrary to the most elementary morality. The press began to criticize Roosevelt for his lack of ideology and for making contradictory decisions. Roosevelt is a chameleon on a scotch plate, the New York Times wrote. And farmers were upset about the decline in agricultural prices, so they demanded government programs that would pay them to slaughter their cattle and to burn their crops in order to boost prices under FDR, which is crazy because people were starving at the same time. Why would you destroy perfectly good agricultural products? Because they actually thought the problem was too many agricultural products. That's scary, uh, you know, because you're, you're committing suicide there. there. There really was a spreading poverty and uh, starvation in some areas. California put guards at some of the borders trying to keep people out. They had state troopers trying to keep people from coming into California because these people would have been or were a burden on, on the state. You could literally see the depression etched in the faces. That's one of those wonderful photographs of people like um, um, Walker Evans and others. You can see the torment. It's, it's like a cancer that ate at the spirit of the American people. And one of the famous, famous pictures of the depression is of the migrant mother that was taken in a pea farm in California. She was a migrant worker coming from another part of the country with her children. with that picture, which is a picture of a lady very hungry with her children just devastated. You look at the picture a bit differently when you know that it was paid for by the government. And the man who ran the program that created this picture wrote in, his, in a memoir of it, we had to make the Depression look bad to keep our job. So you can have real poverty, but also real propaganda. These photos of these fermiers ruined, you have to look at them very attentively. Ce sont des photos très construites d'un dénuement extrêmement bien organisé. C'est la construction d'un tragique, mais qui ne livre pas du tout la totalité de ce qui s'est passé. Et ces fermiers ruinés, ils étaient, ils étaient ruinés souvent bien avant la crise. Et donc, ce n'est pas la crise qui les a ruinés, c'était des catastrophes bien antérieures. Ces photos sont des fabrications de mythes et euh, il faut les prendre comme telles. Il y a toute une famille et puis il y a un lit avec des barreaux et puis un petit enfant qui est tout nu par devant. Il y a euh, un mélange de crasse et de dignité qui, je crois, évoque un mythe mais qui n'est pas du tout de l'ordre du témoignage euh, brut. C'est un témoignage extraordinairement élaboré pour construire ce mythe, mais qui ne répond pas du tout à l'ensemble de, euh, de, des manifestations. Enemies of the New Deal describe those photographs as propaganda on behalf of the New Deal. And they were. In some sense, they were, because a new culture is being born then. It's a culture of popular solidarity, very foreign to America. And it is propaganda, but it's much more than propaganda. It's a, it's a new way of life that's born in the 1930s. The New Deal helped many people. It put millions of people to work, it gave jobs to six million people. It uh, gave work to hundreds of thousands of young people. Was it perfect? No. Were some of the programs bad? Yes, unquestionably. But that's never been in doubt. The New Deal succeeded and failed 
at pulling the country out of the Great Depression. And the economy does actually recover. I don't mean recover back to the levels it didn't, but employment fall, uh, factories start up again, uh, people are, thanks to New Deal legislation, able to own their own homes again or to be able to meet their mortgage payments. There was a sharp rise in the economy, a sharp expansion, and by 1937, the GDP, the total income of the country, was back to the 1929 level after a very sharp fall in the first four years. So there was a recovery. What happened in 1937 is fascinating. Roosevelt listened to a small group of economists and making the claim that you better cut back government spending. So Roosevelt started cutting back on the New Deal, cutting back on the expenditures. And no wonder, as we contracted the expenditures, the economy started weakening. What happened? Back into recession. And unemployment rate went up again. And there was another depression within a depression in the 1936 to 1937 period. So it's simply not true to say that the New Deal ended the Great Depression. It deepened and prolonged it. What ended the Depression is a depressing thing in itself, I suppose, but what ended the Depression was the rapid buildup of military spending because of the growing threat of war in Europe. Once you began to get a military buildup, suddenly you have more jobs than you have people. You go from massive unemployment and massive underutilization in the economy to full tilt overnight. Tout d'un coup, du jour au lendemain, euh, l'Amérique décide que les usines Ford, etc., vont fabriquer des tanks et des jeeps. Il n'y a plus une seule voiture qui sort. Donc l'effort de guerre, c'est un effort de production. Mais du point de vue du taux de chômage, etc., oui, il n'y a pas de doute que, que ça a joué son rôle. Il était associé avec un immense drive pour l'armement de production sur une scale scale, mais aussi pour toutes les choses que les soldats ont besoin, pour les trucks et les clothing. Et c'était ce qui got America back to work again. The economy was boosted by the war industries. So it was a kind of artificial way of keeping the economic system going. None of Roosevelt's efforts managed to restore American industry to its level prior to Black Thursday. It was the war in Europe which kick-started U.S. industry. The Great Depression was over. Seven years of desperate efforts did less to cure the sick economy than a few months of rearmament. Some people have made the wrong conclusion from that and said, you need military expenditures to emerge from a downturn. That's nonsense. That's nonsense. We must be the great arsenal of democracy. For us, this is an emergency as serious as war itself. Government spending on bombs was necessary to protect us against fascism. In March 1938, the German army occupied Austria without firing a single shot. World War II had just begun. And it's essentially only the Second World War that brings the United States back to full employment. So that is certainly true. We did not return to what we consider full employment until 1940. Does war take us out of the Depression? I would be loath to say that, but it certainly had some impact on it. That pump priming on a massive scale represented by World War II produces a prolonged period of, pers of prosperity that lasts for another generation after the war. And in 1944 and 45, the greatest fear of the American people was when the war ends, will the Depression come back? Mm -hmm. 
two million bushels of North African grain, resold to Germany for Swiss francs, paid for by a consortium of banks with a deal in futures that the stock exchange unloads for coffee from Brazilian uplands, destined for Paris before the whole deal sinks. The checks written in indelible links out to race Atlantics, winter hurricanes, our benefactors, three trusts they compete for honor, glory, power, and of course, Profits for all happiness is contained. We learned something from the Great Depression. Whether we've learned them enough uh, is another matter. It's quite remarkable how ready we are to forget all those lessons when times change, and particularly when there's a profit to be made in forgetting that lesson. We had the knowledge to prevent a depression then, but we didn't use it. We didn't know how to do that after 1929, or there wasn't enough conviction for the government to act aggressively. And it's the côté troublant de l'experience Obama. What's que c'est Obama? C'est Roosevelt two years plus tôt. Alors pour dire c'est formidable. Voilà quelqu'un qui va relancer, faire beaucoup plus vite que Roosevelt, ce que Roosevelt avait à peu près fait. Oui, mais qu'il a pris dans son équipe ben, Il a pris des gens. Alors, il y a le côté novateur, c'est le côté écologique, le côté... Alors là, il a mis même carrément un prix Nobel euh, comme ministre, et ça, c'est fabuleux. On voit très bien une ouverture très grande là. Et puis du côté économique, pour n'inquiéter personne, il a mis les responsables qui étaient, qui étaient pris la main dans le sac avant. Et pour la même raison, il n'a pas eu le culot de nationaliser les banques américaines. Donc je pense qu'il y a quand même beaucoup à dire sur les plans de sauvetage qui finiront, euh, bon par produire leurs effets, parce qu'on sait qu'on reviendra sur l'ouvrage jusqu'à ce que ça marche. Mais on a perdu quand même beaucoup, beaucoup de temps. Cette crise, elle a commencé au cours de l'été 2007, on est en 2009, et elle n'est toujours pas réglée. And just like the savants of the 1920s, these folks turned out to be fatally wrong. We're never going to have another crash, we're never going to have another depression. And they were both wrong, of course. They had tools they could have implemented and they did not. It was, a, a, among the tragedies was this adoption of a, a damaging ideology as a cover for allowing the financial uh, industry to do virtually th anything they wanted and for allowing, and mostly motivated by men and women who found a way to make a fortune and claim they were doing good for the nation. The wealth of the richest 1% of the country has increased enormously, and the gap between the rich and poor has become very, very great. And that's exactly what happened in the 1930s. We do need a, a, new, a new deal. Um, the uh, old New Deal was a new deal uh, that worked for the period of the time. Uh, it was a reaction to the Great Depression. Uh, the world changed enormously in 75 years. Uh, we are much wealthier now than we were then. But we have not shared the fruits of that wealth equally. The level of greed simply rose. It was accepted. And greed became a very important part of the financial uh, overreaction, the financial speculation that led to this disaster. We allowed the banks to exploit the poorest Americans. Uh, millions of Americans are losing their homes and with it their life savings. They were preyed on. There was predatory lending. We knew it was going on. It's an unfair system. Those who are poor have nobody to defend them. We live in a world with an enormous amount of resources, and yet a world in which uh, a billion people live under a uh, dollar a day, and 40% of the world live probably under two dollars a day. I, I continue to think that we will be able to reform, for instance, the international economic institutions. Uh, I realize the important role that a reformed international economic institutions can play. Uh, I'm not sure whether I'm a realist or an optimist when I, when I say that, that I think that they... I know I'm a realist to say that they need to be reformed. I'm not sure I'm a realist when I say that they will be reformed. African grain.
sold to Germany for Swiss francs, paid for by a consortium of banks with a deal in futures that the stock exchange unloads for coffee from Brazilian uplands, destined for Paris before the whole deal sinks. The checks written in indelible links out race Atlantics, winter hurricanes. At last the coffee arrives, also the wheat. Needless to say, the deal was a success. Who can deny that all of us have gained? Our benefactors, three trusts, they compete for honor, glory, power, and of course, profits where all happiness is contained.